Located in the Chinese Historical Society of America Museum in Chinatown, San Francisco, We Are Bruce Lee is an exhibit featuring contemporary art and historical artifacts that celebrates the remarkable life of a Chinese-American icon who transcended race, geography, and culture through uncanny strength and resilience. Visitors will see rarely displayed artifacts including drawings and handwritten letters, historic photos, memorabilia, video and film, artwork, and technology designed to create interactive, graphically stunning displays. Thank you for coming to our We Are Bruce Lee exhibition. Um, our, our subheading is Under the Sky, One Family. So we want to show that people are more alike than they are different through Bruce Lee. And of course, since we're in San Francisco, I, I need to share that Bruce Lee was born in San Francisco, Chinatown. Bruce's entire family is from Hong Kong. How Bruce Lee ended up being born in San Francisco is that his father was famous in Chinese opera and he was invited to perform in the theaters in San Francisco in 1940. The wife who was pregnant with Bruce Lee um, came with um, the husband and when it was time to give birth, they gave birth at the Chinese hospital, which is on uh, Jackson Street. They told Bruce's um, family that, it, that since Bruce was gonna be raised in Hong Kong, if he wants to keep his US citizenship, he has to come back to live here at the age of 18. He went to all the Kung Fu schools in Chinatown and he would challenge them to a fight. Bruce's thinking was, okay, if you want to learn how to swim, don't you get into the water? So his extreme thinking was, if you want to learn how to fight, should you go to other Kung Fu schools and challenge them? Um, that's not proper etiquette, so to speak. Bruce's reputation in Chinatown got so bad that if they knew he was coming, they would lock the uh, door. When his father found out about, about Bruce Lee causing trouble, his father was forced to send him to Seattle. That's how Bruce, Bruce Lee ended up going to Seattle, because he was causing too much trouble in San Francisco, Chinatown. Um, but every step of the way was important to Bruce's uh, legacy and life, because Bruce Lee went to the University of Washington, he majored in philosophy. He also met his wife in Seattle, and currently Bruce Lee and his son Brandon are buried there. When I was growing up during the 1960s, I, I became quite ashamed of my Chinese heritage because of all the negative stereotypes in movies, TVs, even comic books. So I never shared to anyone that I was born in Chinatown. Fast forward to me seeing my first Bruce Lee movie, Fist of Fury, my mom brought me to the kitchen, sat me down, and said, Jeff, I'm going to tell you something that you're really going to like. She said, did you know that you and Bruce Lee were born in the same hospital? So I literally fell out of my chair, got back up, and I said, wait till I go back to school now, and not only tell my friends, but brag to them that I was, I was born in the same hospital as Bruce Lee. So because I'm sharing about my childhood, I need to share one important memory from the sixth grade. This a theory came out Friday. My dad took me to see the movie Saturday. When I went back to school on Monday, all my non-Chinese friends were looking at the Chinese a, a little differently. So I said, what's going on here? I didn't find out until it was time to play kickball. I'm sure many of you played kickball when, when you were younger. And it's kind of like a no-brainer that the Asians or the Chinese were usually picked last because of all the negative stereotypes. The two Caucasian team captains were whispering. They said, Jeff, come here. We want to ask you something. I said, what do you want? They said, we just saw that movie, Fist of Fury, and we saw that man named Bruce Lee kick someone right through the wall. Can you Chinese actually do that? So I stood there for like a second, and then I nodded my head. Uh-huh. <laughs> so sometimes perception is, is more powerful than reality, but it felt good because... Literally, what I'm trying to share with you in a nutshell is that on Friday, the Chinese were invisible, 
And then on Monday, which is like overnight, the Chinese were, uh, had become popular, <laughs> thanks to one man and one movie. Bruce Lee did five famous Kung Fu movies. Of the five Bruce Lee movies, my favorite is this one, where Bruce Lee kicks America's Chuck Norris's butt. <laughs> and I'm also Bruce Lee's, uh, Bruce Lee's wife, Linda. I I'm also her friend. And she told me that this is her favorite movie as well. And I asked her why. She said, because Bruce wrote, produced, choreographed, directed, and starred in this movie. So this is the most like the Bruce Lee that she remembers. Throughout the exhibit, you, you will learn that he was m more than just an actor, more than just a Kung Fu star. He was a teacher, a philosopher, a civil rights leader, etc. Bruce Lee had incredibly long arms and extremely long and delicate fingers. So, so, so the way that he moved his arms for a relatively short person made him look taller. When he grew up in Hong Kong, his classmates made fun of him and called him monkey arms because the, the arms would, would be all the way down here. So he used a perceived flaw and he, and he used it as a gift. So through Bruce's inspiration, we, we want to show people that sometimes they think that they're, they're stuck with something that's kind of negative. But, you know, God, God made everyone differently and, 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 and gave us gifts. We just have to learn how to recognize it. This is a very simple poster of Bruce Lee. In fact, most Bruce Lee collectors have this poster and will probably criticize me by saying, Jeff, this is a real exhibition, a real museum. Why do you put this lousy poster here? It's because of the personal story behind the poster. I was born and raised in San Francisco. I, I went to school in San Francisco from kindergarten to the seventh grade. And because of the large Asian population in San Francisco, I didn't face any form of racism when I was growing up. 1974, my dad told us that we had to move and I was very sad. I go, how come we can't stay in San Francisco? Because I love it here. He said, because me, my sister and brother were all sharing one dinky little sunroom and it was getting kind of crowded. So he moved in the summer of 74, and it wasn't until the first day of the eighth grade where I was in total shock. I said, where's all the Chinese? Where, where's all the Asians? So I shockingly found out that I was the only Chinese in, in my entire eighth grade class. So as a result, I got picked on. I got called every racial slur. In the book, they didn't have any anti-bullying laws back then. They didn't have any school counselors. So I was literally on my own and in the beginning I would hide in the library because bullies don't like to go to the libraries. I don't know why, but, but, but it worked, but that could only last for so long. My mom started to notice whenever I would eat I'd have severe stomach pain, so she took me to the doctor. And then the doctor was very shocked. He said, I'd never seen anyone so young, I was only 13, and I had a bleeding ulcer from holding in all, all, all the stress, all the acid was just churning with no escape. So I, I had to go on a very strict diet for a year. Everything I ate was plain, and before each meal, I had to coat my stomach with this really nasty liquid that literally made everything tasteless. So one day, I was in my bedroom, and this is the only Bruce Lee poster that I had in my bedroom wall, and I looked at the poster, and then I was crying, and then it was almost like Bruce Lee was speaking to me, saying, it's, it's okay, Jeff, because I, I Bruce Lee, am Chinese-American. I probably face even more racism than you have. And I said, listen, Bruce, I said, this is probably the darkest period of my young life, and I'm really going to need your help. And if you do help me, one day I'm going to pay you back. So that's why I'm here speaking with all of you now. So I'm sure many of you have seen the Green Hornet TV series. Okay, uh, they created the show because of the success of Batman. And Bruce's costume was Kato, and he wore a chauffeur's outfit, but he wore this mask over here. When they filmed the first episode, there were two problems. The first problem is that the mask kept flying off his face because it's like wearing a pair of glasses. How they solved the problem is that they made a mold of Bruce's face, which is right here, so that the mask could be created to fit like a second skin. Unless your bone structure is similar to Bruce Lee and you try on the mask, it's probably not gonna fit you very well. The second problem is that Bruce Lee moved too fast for the cameras. I don't know if you guys remember what type of TV we had back in the 1960s. It was black and white, tube TV, very fuzzy. None of this high definition stuff that people see nowadays. 
So to see Cato dressed in all black on a fuzzy black and white TV fighting bad guys at nighttime was literally impossible. They initially told Bruce Lee that you're moving too fast, and Bruce's initial response was, too fast, I think I should be going faster. They said, no, 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 please don't go any faster because nobody could see what you're doing. So Bruce Lee slowly learned that in order to look better, he had to slow himself down. That in order to generate power, when you punch someone, you need to cock your fist to punch, right? So Bruce Lee would have his fist about an inch away from someone's chest. I go, boom, and then send them flying. Nice and tight. Okay. Are you ready? So, so you guys are going to get a Kung Fu lesson here. Um, what is stronger, my muscles or the ground? So when I'm sinking, my legs connect to the ground, hip connect to the elbow, elbow connect to my wrist, and keeping my shoulders down, using that connection, I'm simply going like this. This is a drawing of a dragon, and um, it was Brucey himself that drew this dragon. So we want to show that Brucey was not just a martial artist, he was also a very good artist as well. And we got the image of the dragon from this script over here. Yes. So we got the image of the dragon from the script from Enter the Dragon. Uh, this actually was loaned to us by Bruce Lee's uh, daughter. And about 60% of the items here are, are from my, my collection. So basically it's me, uh, Bruce's daughter, and, and one prominent collector from Seattle that have um, loaned our stuff. So since we're on the subject of Enter the Dragon, this is Bruce Lee on the set of Enter the Dragon with his stuntman. I need to point out that during lunchtime, Bruce Lee spent it with the stuntman. He didn't spend it with the director and the producer because it was the stuntman that did all the hard work to make Bruce Lee look good. So the most famous member of Bruce's stunt team was actually Jackie Chan. A lot of people don't know that. Didn't even know that they knew each other. Bruce Lee and Jackie Chan first met each other on the set of his second movie for one scene. The bad guy jumps up, Bruce Lee jumps up, and Bruce Lee kicks the bad guy, and he flies out the door. The director said, cut, and they brought in a very young stunt man who happened to be Jackie Chan. First thing Bruce Lee did is he pulled Jackie's shirt, and he looked inside, and he said, uh-uh, not enough padding. <laughs> you need to stuff more padding in here, because back in the old days, they didn't have CGI. So after Jackie stuffed it, the director said, action. They both jump up, Bruce Lee kicks Jackie and he flies out the door and then he lands so hard that he's clutching his chest going, ay ya And then Bruce runs to Jackie, picks him up and says, are you okay? And Jackie gave him the two thumbs up and Bruce said, wow, I actually gave you a genuine Bruce Lee kick and you're not dead. <laughs> so he said that when I have an important movie in the future, I want to use you. So guess what? In Enter the Dragon, Bruce Lee kills Jackie Chan three times. <laughs> and what makes it so bizarre, it's in the same scene. He said, my definite chief aim, I, Bruce Lee, will be the first highest paid Oriental superstar in the United States. In return, I will give the most exciting performances and render the best of quality in the capacity of an actor. Starting 1970, I will achieve world fame and from then onward till the end of 1980, I will have in my possession ten million dollars. I will live the way I please and achieve inner harmony and happiness. Bruce Lee, January 1969. So before I explain this very unique piece of paper, I'm going to share with all of you that I'm very blessed that I grew up with Bruce Lee as my role model. Someone that looked like me that was able to achieve world fame and world respect. So Bruce's philosophy was that of self-actualization. So he wrote this to motivate himself. And his wife told me that Bruce Lee only showed it to her because his, his friends would have laughed. The one movie that brought Bruce Lee his world fame was Enter the Dragon. The good news is that Enter the Dragon brought Bruce Lee his world fame that he so worked hard for. The extremely sad news is that Bruce Lee died a month before Enter the Dragon was released. He died in July of 1973, Enter the Dragon came out in August of 1973. So he never got to see an inkling of his world fame. And why Jeet Kune Do is revolutionary is because the first time anyone dared to mix any forms of martial arts. 
in the old days, if you mix anything into what you were studying, your master would probably kick you out of class. Mixed martial arts now has become so commonplace that nobody even bats an eye anymore. That's why they refer to Bruce Lee as the unofficial godfather of mixed martial arts. Was Bruce Lee born with muscles or did he have to work hard at it? He had to work extremely hard because Bruce had your typical um, Asian uh, guy's body, very scrawny, uh, very skinny, to the point where he never took a single photo without a shirt prior to 1964. When you watch a Bruce Lee movie, what usually happens in a Bruce Lee movie? He, either he rips off his own shirt or somebody rips it off him so he, he could expose his, his body. So he was actually introduced to bodybuilding when he moved to Oakland in 1964. He was introduced to a man named Alan Joe, who was the first and only Chinese American bodybuilding champion. Bruce said, if I teach you Kung Fu, can you teach me how to build up my body? This is on the set of Enter the Dragon, Bruce Lee's most important movie. And you would assume he's holding the script, but guess what Bruce Lee is holding? He is holding a dance book. So the story goes is that the director was criticizing Bruce Lee by saying, we are trying to film Enter the Dragon, a major martial arts movie. Why do I keep seeing you holding a dance book? Are you concentrating? Bruce was concentrating at a level so high that most people wouldn't understand what Bruce was doing. To combine dance with martial arts to create something very beautiful in terms of the choreography. It also helped that Bruce Lee had a very strong dance background. He was a 1958 Hong Kong cha-cha dance champion. And these are his cha-cha fancy step booklet that he had in his back pocket when, when he became the cha-cha uh, champion. When you see the photo of him in 1958, I wasn't exaggerating when I said he was extremely scrawny. I mean, you don't see muscle, any muscle tone whatsoever. So a move from that to Bruce Lee uh, working out here. So of course, Bruce Lee worked on his uh, stamina, weight training, flexibility. What is Bruce Lee doing here? And it's not easy. He's literally planking the entire lower portion of his body resting on his uh, shoulder blades. Why this photo is important to Bruce's legacy is because shortly after he took this photo, he severely injured his back. And it was so severe that the doctor put him to bed rest for three months and told Bruce Lee after three months, no more Kung Fu ever again, no more weight training ever again. When you tell another Bruce Lee, do you think he's just gonna go to an, into a corner and start crying? No, his, his philosophy was that there's always a way despite the odds. Bruce Lee knew that he had to work ex extra extremely hard in order to succeed with that back problem. Because to be honest, his back problem never left him until the day that he died. So this is a Wing Chun wooden dummy. This is what we uh, practice on. I, I also practice uh, Wing Chun. Um, these are supposed to be someone's arms and this is supposed to be someone's leg. I, I've trained in Wing Chun and I also had classmates that also bought a wooden dummy and some of them get lazy and, and end up using this as a coat wrap. So, uh, Bruce Lee had kicked the wooden leg on his dummy so hard that it snapped in half. And being the owner of a Wing Chun dummy, to replace a wooden leg literally costs an arm and a leg. So Bruce Lee didn't have that much money, so he was very practical and he made the leg out of steel. This is the real Ip Man. He was Bruce Lee's first and only Kung Fu teacher. You could easily see that he's even shorter and even skinnier than Bruce Lee. But yet, Ip Man in his 70s could still handle Bruce Lee because the art of Wing Chun was created by a female. So because it was created by a female, there's no reliance on speed, strength, or size. Okay, so right, right now we're fighting force versus force. Who's gonna win? The bigger, younger, stronger guy. So in Wing Chun, we're not supposed to fight this force. Okay, so push? Yeah. So are you okay? okay. So, so in, in slow motion, uh, I just simply re redirect his energy, slide my hand up, and then giving him a little present. So, so that didn't take any speed, strength, or size. It took this. In the old days, Chinese could only teach Chinese the art of Kung Fu. 
When you see the makeup of Bruce's class, it kind of looks like the United Nations, because you see almost every race represented. Because Brucey didn't care about the color of your skin, as long as you are sincere at learning, he would teach you. Which showed that he always thought out of the box. And sometimes when you do think out of the box, you're taking a big, big risk and you tend to get into a lot of trouble. As we know, Bruce Lee got into a lot of trouble, but he didn't care. One prominent student of Bruce Lee was his future wife, Linda. I asked Linda, did you really join the school because you wanted to learn Kung Fu? And she said, no. She heard from a girlfriend about this cute looking uh, Chinese guy that was teaching Kung Fu in Seattle and she wanted to check it out. And of course, her plan worked because Bruce Lee started to notice uh, Linda as well. And she told me that one day Bruce demonstrated on Linda. He gently flipped her over his shoulder, bent down and asked Linda, would you like to go to the Space Needle? And she smiled and said, that'd be wonderful. Who else is going? He said, just us two. So of course that became their, their first date. And of course they eventually got married but because he was Chinese and she was Caucasian, her family didn't really accept him. So when they did get married, they did it privately at, um, I guess, uh, City Hall. But when you get married anywhere, your names end up in the local paper. So when the relatives saw the names uh, that they got married, they got into a bunch of trouble for it, which kind of forced them to move from Seattle to Oakland. But the good news is that Linda's entire family grew, grew to, to, to love Bruce when they finally knew who, who he actually was as a person, which shows that it's, it's more important that what is on the inside than what is on the outside. Brucey was a very good looking guy, very photogenic. So this magazine only featured African-American singers and actors. That's why you see Al Green, the Jackson Five, Isaac Hayes. So the African-American people respected Bruce Lee so much that they put him on the cover of one of their magazines. And from my research, I found out he's the only non-black person to ever make it to the cover of Real Soul. We of course have uh, Russian nesting dolls with um, Bruce Lee's five movies. We have famous uh, cartoon characters wearing the famous yellow and black outfit. Bruce Lee did cho choose the colors because in Chinese culture, red and gold are, are very lucky. Uh, so he not only changed the yin-yang symbol, he added the arrows that always show that it's always flowing, always changing. And in Chinese, it says, using no way as way, having no limitation as limitation. This is the highest level of Jeet Kune Do called emptiness, the formless form. And in my personal opinion, there's only one person that could reach this level, is Bruce Lee himself. Bruce Lee said, when you reach this level and you're in a fight, you don't actually hit it hits all by itself. So in your quest to become the next Bruce Lee, good luck. <laughs> and of course, Bruce Lee would always draw his idea on a piece of paper and his friend who was very good at making things would make it based on the drawings. So Bruce Lee wanted one singular object to represent his feelings toward traditional martial arts. <laughs> that if you blindly follow a form of martial arts just for the sake of tradition and you use it in a modern day fight, you're gonna get killed. <laughs> we show that Bruce Lee didn't like to mince words. He liked to get very direct. So the basic plot of the movie is that the Japanese had invaded China and took control of parts of China. And it was the Japanese that killed his Kung Fu teacher. So he's trying to find the killers, but in this simple scene, he just wants to go into the park. But the guard's gonna stop him and point out the uh, sign over there. But, but yet a dog goes in and then the guard doesn't even stop him because he's probably walked in by that Caucasian lady. And then uh, of course the, uh, the Japanese villains are gonna come and the villain in brown is gonna tell Bruce Lee, I'll take you into the park, but you gotta walk in like a dog.
Right. <laughs>